Congregation, our text for this sermon is Genesis 19, verse 16, where we read, And while he lingered, the men took hold of his hand, his wife's hands, and the hands of his two daughters, the Lord being merciful to him, and they brought him out and set him outside the city. We will especially focus on the words, he lingered. Who is this man that lingered? Well, it was Lot. He was the nephew of faithful Abraham. And when did he linger? He lingered the very morning that Sodom was to be destroyed. And where did he linger? Well, he lingered within the walls, the very walls of Sodom itself. And before who did he linger? Well, he lingered under the eyes of the two angels who were sent to bring him out of, bring him to safety out of the city. He lingered. Congregation, the words are very serious and they are full of food for thought. And I hope that they will make us think. Who knows? Maybe these words are the very words that your soul requires. From Luke 17, verse 32. The voice of the Lord Jesus commands you, commands us to remember Lot's wife. But the words of one of his ministers this morning that we will read from invites you this day to remember Lot. And we will see by five points what Lot was of himself, what the text tells us of him, what reasons may account for his lingering, what kind of fruit his lingering brought forth, And lastly, what was Lot? Our first point is a very important point. If we leave it unnoticed, we might miss that class of professing Christians that we want especially to benefit. You might say after hearing this sermon, well, that Lot. That Lot, he was a poor, dark creature. He was an unconverted man. He was a child of this world. No wonder he lingered. Well, just listen to what I say. Lot was nothing of the kind. Lot was a true believer. He was a real child of God. A justified soul. He was a righteous man. Does any one of you here have grace in your hearts? So also had Lot. Does any one of you have a hope of salvation? So also had Lot. Is any one of you a new creature? So also was Lot. Is any one of you a traveler in the narrow way which leads unto life? So also was Lot. I don't think that this is only my private opinion and it's, it's in my own notion, something unsupported by the Scriptures. Do not suppose that I want you to believe it just because I say it. For the Holy Ghost has placed the matter beyond controversy by calling him just and righteous. And has given us evidence of that grace that was in him. One evidence is that he lived in a wicked place, seeing and hearing evil all around him, and yet he was not wicked himself. Now, to be a Daniel in Babylon, to be an Obadiah in Ahab's house, an Abijah in Jeroboam's family, or a saint in Nero's court, and a righteous man in Sodom, a man must have the grace of God. Another evidence is that he vexed his soul from day to day with the lawless deeds that he saw. And he did not after a while become cool and lukewarm about sin, seeing this day after day. Seeing it day after day did not take the fine edge of the feelings Off, as too often is the case, many men are shocked and startled at the first sight of wickedness. And yet, after a while, they become so accustomed to seeing it that they are hardly concerned about it anymore. This is especially the case with those who live in large towns and cities, but it was not so with Lot. And this is a great mark of the reality of his grace. This was the type of man that Lot was. He was a just and he was a righteous man. He was a man sealed and stamped as an heir of heaven by the Holy Ghost himself. 
But one thing we must remember is that a true Christian may have many blemishes, many defects, many infirmities, and yet be a true Christian nevertheless. You do not despise gold because it's mixed with much waste. You do not undervalue grace because it is accompanied by much corruption. We will now go on to the second point of this sermon. And we will find that Lot, he paid dearly for his lingering. But please do not forget this one thing. Please do not forget that Lot, he was a child of God. So what does the text tell us about Lot's behavior? Well, the words he lingered are actually quite astounding. And the more you consider and think about the time and the circumstances, the more astounding that you will think these words are. Lot knew the awful condition of the city in which he stood. Genesis 19 verse 13 says, The outcry against them has grown great before the face of the Lord. And yet he lingered. Lot knew the fearful judgment that was coming down on all within the walls of the city. The angels had said it very plainly. The Lord has sent us to destroy it. And yet, Lot knew that God was a God who always kept his word. And if God said that he was going to do something, he would for sure do it. He could hardly be Abraham's nephew and live a long time with him and not be aware of this. And yet, Lot lingered. Lot believed there was danger. For we read that he went to his sons-in-laws and he warned them, Get up! Flee, he said. Get out of this place. For the Lord will destroy the city. And yet he lingered. Lot saw the angels of God right there in front of him, standing by, waiting for him and his family to flee the city. And yet he lingered. Lot heard the voice of those ministers of wrath ringing in his ears to hurry him. Arise, lest you be consumed in the punishment of the day. And yet, Lot lingered. He was slow when he should have been quick. He was backwards when he should have been going forwards. He was dallying when he should have been hastening. He was being idle when he should have been hurrying. Cold when he should have been hot. It's almost, it's almost unreal. It seems almost incredible and appears too amazing to be true, but the Spirit has written it down for our learning. And yet, congregation, there are many of the Lord Jesus' people who are very much like Lot. Please listen to what I say. I'm going to repeat it so that there will be no mistake about my meaning. I've shown you that Lot lingered. And I say that there are many Christian men and many Christian women in this day who are very much like Lot. There are many real children of God who appear to know far more than they live up to and see far more than they practice. And yet they continue in this state for many years. Well, it's, it's very good that they go on as far as they do in their Christian life. And yet they go no further. They believe in the Trinity. They love the truth. They love sound preaching. And they agree to every article of the Christian doctrine when they hear it. But still, there is this undescribable something that is not satisfactory about them. They're constantly doing things that disappoint the expectations of their ministers and of more advanced Christian friends. It is good that they think the way that they do, but yet they stand still. They believe in heaven, and yet they seem faintly to long for it. They believe in hell, and yet they seem very little to fear it. They love the Lord Jesus, but the work that they do for Him is small. They hate the devil, but they often appear to tempt Him to come to them. They know time is short. But they live as if it were long. They know they have a battle to fight, yet a man would think that they were at peace. They know they have a race to run. Yet they often look at people, they look like people who are sitting still. They know that the judge is at the door and that there is wrath to come. And yet they appear half asleep. Astonishing that they should be what they are. And yet 
Nothing more. And what shall we say of these people? They often puzzle godly friends and relatives, and they often cause great anxieties. They often give reason for great doubts and heart searchings. But they can all be classed under one sweeping description. They're all brothers, and they're all brothers and sisters of Lot. They linger. These are those who get the notion into their minds that it's impossible for all believers to be very holy and to be very spiritual. They believe the outstanding, they believe that outstanding holiness, it's a beautiful thing. They like to read about it in books and even see it in, occasionally in others. But they do not think that all are meant to aim at such a high standard. At any rate, they seem to make up their minds that it's beyond their reach. They are those who get this into their heads. False ideas of charity, as they call it. They would gladly please everybody and help everybody and be agreeable to everybody, but they forget that they should first make sure that they please God. These are the ones who dread being sacrificial in their lives. And they shrink back from self-denial. They never appear to be able to apply our Lord's command to cut off the right hand and to pluck out the right eye. They spend their lives in trying to make the gate more wide and the cross more light, but they never succeed. These are the ones who are always trying to keep in with the world, as it were. They're creative in discovering reasons for not separating from it and coming up with convincing excuses for attending questionable places of amusement and keeping up questionable friendships. One day you're told that they're attending a Bible study and the next day you're perhaps heard that they're going to maybe a dance. They're constantly working to persuade themselves that to mix a little with the worldly people on their own ground, it it does good. Yet, in their case, it is very clear that it does them no good and it only does them harm. These are the ones who cannot find it in their heart to fight with their troubling sin whether it is laziness or bad temper or pride or selfishness or impatience or whatever sin it may be, they allow it to remain a tolerable, quiet, undisturbed tenant of their hearts. They say, well, it's part of me. It's part of my makeup. It's, it's my character or it's the result of my upbringing. Yeah. My father, my mother, my grandmother, they were all like this too. And these people, they are sure that they cannot help it. And when you meet them, after being apart for a year or so, you hear the same thing. But all in all, it can be summed up in one single sentence. They are the brothers and the sisters of Lot. They linger. Yes, congregation, if you are a lingering soul, you're not happy. You can't be happy. You know you're not. It would be strange if you were happy. Lingering is the sure destruction of a happy Christian. A lingerer's conscience forbids him to enjoy inward peace. Perhaps at one time you did run, you did run well, but you've left your first love. You've never felt the same comfort since, and you never will till you return to your first works. Like Peter, when the Lord Jesus was taken prisoner, you were following the Lord afar off. And like Him, you will find the way. It is not pleasant, but it is very hard. So come. Come and look at Lot. Come and consider Lot's history. Come and consider Lot's lingering. And be wise, my friends. Please, be wise. We will next consider the reasons that may account for Lot's lingering. This is also a question of great importance. And I ask you to pay serious attention to it. To know the root of a disease is one step towards a remedy. He that is forewarned is forearmed. Is there anyone here that feels secure and has no fear of lingering? Well, come and listen 
Well, I tell you, a few passages of Lot's history do as he did. And it will be a miracle indeed if you do not get into the same state of soul as Lot did. One thing that I see in Lot is this, that he made the wrong choice in early in life. There was a time when Abraham and Lot lived together. They both became rich and they could live no longer together. Abraham, the elder of the two, in a true spirit of humility and courtesy, he gave Lot the choice of the country when they resolved to part company. If you, he said, will take the left hand, then I will go to the right. Or if you go to the right, then I will go to the left. And what did Lot do? We are told he saw the plains of Jordan near Sodom. They were fertile and they were rich and they were well watered. It was a good land for cattle, full of pastures. And he had large flocks and herds and and it just suited his requirements. And this was the land that he chose for his residence. Simply because it was rich and a well watered land. Well, it was near the town of Sodom. But he didn't care about that. The men of Sodom, who would be his neighbors, were wicked. It didn't matter. They were sinners before God exceedingly. But it made no difference to him. The pasture was rich. The land was good. And he wanted a country like that for his flocks and herds. And with this argument going on in his mind, all common sense and doubts, if indeed he had any, were down. They were gone. He chose by sight and not by faith. He asked no counsel of God to preserve him from mistakes. He looked to the things of time and not to the things of eternity. He thought of his worldly profit and not of his soul. He considered only what would help him in this life. He forgot the serious business of the life to come. This was a very bad beginning. But we also notice that Lot mixed with sinners when there was no reason for him having to. We're first told that he pitched his tent towards Sodom. This, as I have already shown, was a great mistake. But the next time he is mentioned, we find him actually living in Sodom itself. The Spirit says expressly that he dwelt in Sodom. His tents were left. The country was forsaken, and he occupied a house in the very streets of that wicked town. We're not told of the reasons of this change. We're not aware of any event that could have arisen for it. We're not sure. There could have been, we are sure that there could have been no command of God. Maybe his wife liked the town better than the country. For the social life, it's plain that she had no grace herself. Perhaps she persuaded Lot that it was better for the education of their daughters. Perhaps the daughters urged living in the town for the sake of fun friends and fun company. They were obviously light-minded young women themselves. Maybe Lot liked it himself in order to make more profit from his flocks and his herds. But one thing is very clear, that Lot dwelt in the midst of Sodom without a good cause. Congregation, when a child of God does these two things that have been mentioned. You don't have to be surprised that after a while you hear of unfavorable things about his soul. You do not have to wonder if he becomes deaf to the warning voice of affliction as Lot was and turns out a lingerer in the day of trial and danger as Lot did. Make a wrong choice, an unscriptural choice in life, And settle yourself down unnecessarily in the midst of a worldly people. And I know no surer way to damage your own spirituality and to go backwards with eternal things. This is the way to make the pulse of your soul beat feebly and slowly. This is the way to make the edge of your feelings about sin become blunt and dull. This is the way to dim the eyes of your spiritual discernment till you can hardly distinguish good from evil and you stumble as you walk. This is the way to bring a moral palsy on your feet and your limbs and make you go tottering and trembling along the road to Zion as if the grasshopper was a burden. This is the way to give entrance to your worst enemy, to give 
the devil the advantage ground in the battle. To tie your arms in fighting and to shackle your legs in running. To dry up the sources of your strength and to cripple your own energies. To cut off your hair like Samson and give yourself into the hands of the Philistines. And to put out your own eyes and grind at the mill and become a slave. Dear friends, we must wake up. We must wake up and pay attention to what the servant of God is saying. We must settle these things in our mind and we are not to forget them. We must remember them in the morning. We must recall them to memory at night. We have to let them sink down deeply into our hearts if we want to be safe from lingering. Beware of needless mingling with worldly people. Beware of Lot's choice. If you do not want to settle down into a dry, dull, sleepy, barren, heavy and carnal, senseless, sluggish state of soul, beware of Lot's choice. Remember this in choosing a place to live. It's not enough that the house is comfortable, the area is good, the air quality is fine, the neighborhood is pleasant, living expenses are small, living there is cheap. These are all, there are other things that you should consider, but you must first think of your immortal soul. Will the house you are thinking of help you towards heaven or hell? Is the gospel preached within an easy distance? Is Christ crucified within the reach of your door? Is there a real man of God near who will watch over your soul? I urge you, if you love life, not to overlook this. Beware of Lot's choice. Remember this in choosing a calling, a place of profession in life. It's not enough that the salary is high, the wages are good, the work is light, the advantages, the advantages are numerous, the prospects of advancing are a good possibility. Think of your soul. Your immortal soul, will it be starved? Will it be prospered or will it be drawn back? I plead with you by the mercies of God to think seriously of what you are doing. Make no wrath decision. Look at the place in every light, the light of God as well as the light of the world. Gold may be bought for much, too much. Beware of Lot's choice. Remember this in choosing a husband and wife. If you are unmarried, it's not enough that your eye is pleased and that your desires are met and that you have found a good friend and that there is kindness and affection, that there is a comfortable home to live in. There has to be something more than this. There is a life yet to come. Think of your soul, your immortal soul. Will it be helped upwards or will it be drowned downwards by this union you are planning? Will it be made more heavenly Or will it be made more earthly? Draw near to Christ or to the world? Will its religion grow in vigor? Or will it decay? Please listen to what I say. By all of your hopes of glory, allow this to enter into your calculations. Think, as old Baxter once said, and think, and think, and think again before you commit yourself. Be not unequally yoked. Marriage is nowhere named among the the means of conversion. Remember Lot's choice. Remember this if you're ever offered a good job. It's not enough that you have a good pay and regular employment and you have the confidence of the owner and the best chance of rising to a higher position. These things are good, but they're not everything. How will your soul prosper if you have to work on Sundays? What day of the week will you have for God and eternity? What opportunities will you have for hearing the gospel preached? I solemnly warn you to consider this. It will profit you nothing to fill your bank account if you bring leanness and poverty to your soul. Beware of selling your Sabbath for the sake of a good job. Beware of Lot's choice. Well, Someone may think, well, you know, a believer, he doesn't have nothing to fear. He is a sheep in Christ. He'll never perish. He cannot come to too much harm. It cannot be that such a small matter can be of great importance. Well, you may think so. But I warn you, if you neglect them, your soul will never prosper. A true believer will certainly not be cast away. 
although he may linger. But if he does linger, it is vain to suppose that his religion will thrive. Grace is a tender plant. Unless you cherish it and nurse it well, it will soon become sickly in this evil world. It may droop, though it cannot die. The brightest gold will soon become dim when exposed to a damp atmosphere. The hottest iron will soon become cold. It requires pains and toils to bring it to a red heat. It requires nothing but leaving it alone or a little cold water to become black and hard. You may be an earnest, zealous Christian now. You may feel like David in his prosperity where he said, I shall never be moved. But do not be deceived. You have only got to walk in Lot's steps and make Lot's choices and you will soon come to Lot's state of soul. Allow yourself to do as he did. Start to act as he acted. And be very sure that you will soon discover that you have become a wretched lingerer like him. You will find like Samson, the presence of the Lord is no longer with you. You will prove to your own shame an undecided, hesitating man in the day of trial. There will come a canker on your religion that will eat out its energy without you knowing it. There will come a depletion of your spiritual strength and it will waste away. And after a while, you will wake up to find your hands hardly able to do the Lord's work and your feet hardly able to carry you along the Lord's way and your faith no bigger than a grain of mustard seed. And this, perhaps, at some turning point in your life, will be at the time when the enemy is coming in like a flood and when your need is the greatest. Yes, dear Christian, if you do not want to become a lingerer in religion, consider these things. Beware of doing what Lot did. <clears throat> Let us now see what kind of fruit Lot's lingering spirit bore at last. I could not pass over this point for many reasons, and especially in this present day. There are maybe a lot who will feel inclined to say, well, after all, Lot was saved. He was justified. He got to heaven. And I want no more than that. If I can just get to heaven, I will be content. If this is a thought of your heart, pay attention for a moment and listen to me a little longer. I will show you one or two things in Lot's history which deserves attention and may, may perhaps cause you to change your mind. I think it's very important to dwell on this subject. I will always argue that holiness and usefulness are very closely connected and that happiness and following the Lord with all your heart go hand in hand and that if believers will linger, they must not expect to be useful in their day and their generation or to enjoy great comfort and peace in believing. Take notice then for one thing. Lot did no good among the inhabitants of Sodom. Lot lived in Sodom for many years, and no doubt he had many precious opportunities for speaking of the things of God and trying to turn away many souls from sin. But Lot seems to have no effect on anyone at all. He appears to have no weight or influence with the people who lived around him. He possessed none of that respect and reverences which even the men of the world will often give to a bright servant of God. Not one righteous person could be found in all of Sodom, outside the walls of Lot's home. Not one of his neighbors believed his testimony. Not one of his acquaintances honored the Lord when he worshipped. Not one of his servants served his master's God. Not one of all the people from every quarter cared even a little for his opinion when he tried to restrain their wickedness. This one came in to stay here, and he keeps acting as a judge, they said of him. His life carried no weight. His words were not listened to. His religion, it drew none. And really, I do not wonder. Because as a rule of thumb, lingering souls do no good to the world, and they bring no credit to God's cause. Their salt has too little flavor to season the corruption around them. There's nothing magnetic and there's nothing attractive and Christ reflecting about their ways. Congregation, we must remember this. 
in our daily living. We should take note of another thing, that Lot helped no relations toward heaven. We're not told how large his family was, but this we know, that he had a wife, and he had two daughters at least. And the day that he was called out of Sodom, if he had not more children besides, we don't know. But whether Lot's family was large or small, one thing I think is perfectly clear, there was not one among them all that feared God. When he went out and spoke to his sons-in-law, which married his daughters, and he warned them to flee from the coming judgments, we are told, but to his sons-in-law, he seemed to be joking. What fearful words these are. It was as good as saying, who cares for anything that you say? As long as the world stands, these words, these words will be a painful proof of the disrespect with which a lingerer in religion is regarded. And what was Lot's wife? She left the city in his company, but she did not go far. She did not have the faith to see the need of such a speedy flight. She left her heart in Sodom when she began to flee. She looked back from behind her husband in spite of his plainest command not to do so and was at once turned into a pillar of salt. And what were Lot's two daughters? Oh, they escaped indeed, but only to do the devil's work. They became their father's tempters to wickedness and led him to commit the foulest of sins. In short, Lot stood alone in his family. He was not made the means of keeping one soul back from the gates of hell. And I do not wonder, for lingering souls are seen through by their own families, and when seen through, they are despised. Their closest relations understand inconsistency. If they understand nothing else in religion, they draw the sad but not unnatural conclusion. Surely if he believed all he professes to believe, he would not go on as he does. Lingering parents seldom have godly children. The eye of the child drinks in more than the ear. A child will always observe what you do much more than what you say. We must remember this. Take note of a third thing, that Lot left no evidences behind him when he died. We know very little about Lot after his flight from Sodom. And all that we do know is disappointing. His pleading for Zoar because it was a little one. His departure from Zoar afterwards. And his conduct in his cave. All, all tell the same story. All show the same weakness of grace that was in him and the low state of soul which he had fallen. We do not know how long after his escape, how long he lived. We do not know where he died or when he died, whether he saw Abraham again, what way he died, what he said or what he thought. All these are hidden things. We are told of the last days of Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph, David, but not one word about Lot. Oh, what a gloomy deathbed. The deathbed of Lot must have been. The scripture appears to draw a veil around him on purpose. There's a painful silence about his latter end. He seems to go out like an expiring lamp and leave a bad taste behind him. And had we not been specifically told in the New Testament that Lot was just and righteous, I really believe that we would have doubted whether Lot was a saved soul at all. But I'm not surprised at his sad ending. Lingering believers will generally reap according as they have sown. Their lingering often meets them when their spirit is departing. They have little peace at the end. They reach heaven, to be sure, but they reach it in darkness and in storm. They are saved, but saved so as by fire. Congregation, consider these three things that I have just mentioned and do not misunderstand the meaning. It's amazing to observe how quickly people find an excuse for misunderstanding the things that concern their souls. I'm not saying that believers who do not linger will always be great instruments of usefulness to the world. Noah preached for 120 years and no one believed him. The Lord Jesus was not esteemed by his own people, the Jews. 
I am also not saying that believers who do not linger will over time be the means of converting their families and relations. Many of David's children were ungodly. The Lord Jesus was not believed on even by his own brethren. But I do say that it is almost impossible not to see a connection between Lot's evil choice and Lot's lingering. And between Lot's lingering and his unprofitableness to his family and the world. I believe the Spirit wants us to see it, and that the Spirit meant for it to be a beacon to all professing Christians. I am sure the lessons that I have tried to draw from the whole history of Lot deserve serious reflection. But let me now say a few parting words to all who hear this sermon, and especially to all who call themselves believers in Christ. I have no wish to make your heart sad. I do not want to give you a gloomy view of the Christian life. My only object is to give you friendly warnings and I want you to have peace and to have comfort. My desire is to see you happy as well as safe and joyful as well as justified. I have spoken the way I did for your good. We live in a time when lot-like lingering abounds. The church of today is very superficial, the Christianity. A great number of people call themselves Christians, but... This Christianity requires little or no sacrifice. It entails no cross. We need to walk closely with God to be really spiritually minded. To behave like strangers and pilgrims here on earth. To be separate from the world in how we spend our time, in our conversations, in our amusements, and in our dress code. To be a faithful witness for Christ in all places. To leave a taste of our Master and all of society to be prayerful, humble, unselfish, and to be meek, to be seriously afraid of sin and aware of the danger from the world. They all seem to be rare things these days. They're not common among those who are called true Christians. And worst of all, the absence of them is not felt and grieved as it should be. Congregation, we have been given good advice this morning. Do not turn away from it. Do not be angry with this straightforward speaking. I urge you, be diligent to make your calling and your election sure. I plead with you not to be slothful, not to be careless, not to be content with a small measure of grace, not to be satisfied with being a little bit better than the world. I seriously warn you not to attempt doing what can never be done. And what I mean is this, to serve Christ and to also be part of the world. I'm calling to you and pleading with you. I command you and exhort you by all your hopes of heaven and your desires of glory. Do not be a lingering soul. Can you discern the times? The shaking of nations, the uprooting of ancient things, the overturning of kingdoms, the stir and the restlessness of men's minds, they all say, Christian, do not linger you want to be found ready for Christ at His second appearing with your loins girded and your lamp burning, yourself prepared and bold and prepared to meet Him, then do not linger. Do you want to have lots of comfort in your religion? Feel the witness of the Spirit within you? Know who you have believed and not be a gloomy and a depressed Christian? Then do not linger. Would you like to enjoy assurance of your own salvation in the day of sickness and on your deathbed? Would you like to see with the eye of faith heaven opening and Jesus rising to receive you? Then do not linger. Do you want to leave strong evidence behind you when you were gone? Would you like us to lay you in the grave with a comfortable hope and talk of your state after death without a doubt? Then do not linger. Do you want to be useful to God in your lifetime? Would you like to attract men from sin to Christ and make your master's cause beautiful in their eyes? Then do not linger. Would you like to help your children and relatives towards heaven and make them say, we will go with you and not make them infidels and despisers of all religion? Then do not linger. Would you like to have a great crown in the day of Christ's appearing and not be the least and smallest star in glory? and not find yourself the last and lowest in the kingdom of God, then do not linger. O please, dear Christian, let not one of us linger. 
Time doesn't. Death does not. Judgment doesn't. The devil doesn't. The world doesn't. Neither let the children of God linger. My friend, are you a lingerer? Has your heart felt heavy and your conscience ache while you've, while you've been listening to this sermon? Does something within you whisper, I am the man, I am the woman. Please listen to what I'm saying. How is it with your soul? If you are a lingerer, you must just go to Christ at once and be cured. You must use the old remedy. You must bathe in the old fountain. You must turn again to Christ and be healed. The way to do something is to just do it. And do this at once. Don't think for a moment that your case is past recovery. Don't think that because you've been living in a dry and heavy state of soul for a long time that there is no hope of revival. Is not the Lord Jesus Christ an appointed physician for the soul? Did he not cure every form of disease? Did he not cast out every kind of devil? Did he not raise poor backsliding Peter and put a new song in his mouth? Oh, no, do not doubt, but earnestly believe that he will yet revive his work within you. Only turn from lingering and confess your foolishness and come. Come at once to Christ. Blessed are the words of the prophet. Only acknowledge your iniquity. Return, you backsliding children, and I will heal your backsliding. Also, remember the souls of others as well as your own. If at any time you see any brother or sister lingering, try to wake them up. Try to arouse them. Try to stir them up. Let us all exhort one another as we have opportunity. Let us provoke unto love and good works. Let us not be afraid to say to each other, Brother, or sister, have you forgotten Lot? Awake and remember Lot. Awake, dear Christian, and linger no more. Amen.